stimulating sessions. Uh, Emily Bell spent 20 years at The Guardian and for the last seven years founding director of the Tau Center for Journalism, which looks at the intersection of technology and journalism uh, at Columbia uh, University uh, in New York. Uh, Emily is going to give us some insights uh, and join the stage to wrap up events for this afternoon. Emily. Good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I have the dubious pleasure of being uh, between you and the free bar on a sunny, sunny evening. So I'm going to go really quickly through my um, 60 slides. Don't laugh, there really are 60 slides. Uh, I told my boss, Sheila Coronel, who I think is at the back. Hi, Sheila. Uh, I bumped into her in a corridor. She said, I'm really interested in what you've got to say. I said, great, there's only 60 slides. And she went, Anyway, so let's get on with them. Um, this is research we've been doing for two years at the Tau Center under something called Platforms and Publishers. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is our latest um, insights from that, and there's some new stuff in here as well. I always like to put the funder slide up first, not just to say thank you for the money, but to make the point that the research we do is foundation funded. It's not funded by technology companies. Um, we've been doing it since 2014, uh, and we thought in 2014 that the most important relationship for publishers over the next three or four years was going to be with social platforms. We're really pleased that turned out to be right. We didn't quite know how right it was going to turn out to be. Um, the two years we've done a whole ton of things, um, from focus groups in the Midwest through to um, content analysis. We collect data from publisher outputs every quarter. Uh, and we've done about, well, well over 100 interviews with 40 publishers, six platforms um, over a period of two years. And some of that we repeat just to see what's actually shifting. Um, and this year we've done something new, which is we had a, 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 so we've done a survey with um, the API, the American Press Institute, and NORC, uh, and I'll be giving you the results of that, which is the first time anyone's seen them. Um, we know uh, that in the last two years, one very important thing has happened, which is, uh, if you like, the kind of parameters of this relationship between publishers and platforms has shifted. Um, the main reason it shifted, to my mind, is because of the work of investigative journalists and independent academic researchers like our own Jonathan Albright. So we had uh, amazing stories like Craig Silverman in BuzzFeed and the fake news um, revelations, right the way through to Carol Cadwallader and her amazing scoop in The Observer about Cambridge Analytica, which has completely changed everything. Um, so we've ended up in April 2018, this year, with uh, Mr. Zuckerberg here, who is, you know, the steward of the chief platform, answering questions both on Capitol Hill and also to the European Parliament. And incidentally, if you are European and you are here, then uh, people from the American publishing industry should be coming up and thanking you, because certainly without some of the regulatory uh, pressure, um, which has been applied from Europe, which also American publishers are now looking to as a way to apply their own pressure, I don't think that this would have happened. So what happened uh, in our survey of about, we took, uh, th these are American and Canadian newsrooms. We had about a thousand, over, over a thousand respondents. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to find out how journalists feel about social platforms, because We've been looking at their output to assess the relationship, but we also wanted to know what they were thinking. Um, first slide, uh, we asked, to what degree have your newsrooms changed their news production in relation to the activities of social platforms? Probably no surprise that 41% have made major changes, 42% have made minor changes, uh, about 15% have made no changes at all, 
Um, now, that could be because they feel themselves completely outside social, or it could be because they were set up to be social first and they didn't feel that they actually needed to make many changes. Um, and then a very few didn't know or skip that question. Um, next one. On the whole, we asked, would you say social media platforms such as Facebook have strengthened your newsroom's relationship to its audience, weakened it, or have you seen no change? Really interesting to me this. 56% of uh, the respondents said that they felt that Facebook and social platforms had actually strengthened their relationship with their audience. And this is going to be a theme of sort of everything I'm talking about this evening is really that um, pivot to reader that we're experiencing in publishing and how newsrooms are actually adapting to that. Um, to, again, about, I think that's 22% said weakened relationships. Um, about 15% said no change. Um, higher percentage didn't know whether or not um, engaging with social platforms had improved uh, their uh, relationship. Um, oh, hold on. Just go back again. Um, ah, so this is an interesting one again, which is in general, how much responsibility should social media platforms take for financially supporting journalism? I expected this to actually be lower. I thought that lots of journalists have been saying we don't really want social platforms and large technology companies in our business, but that's not actually true. When it comes to offering money, 56% said that, that really these social platforms have a great deal or quite a lot of responsibility towards um, journalism, directly supporting journalism. Um, and the blue, uh, which again is about 20%, said a moderate amount. Um, but then there was a quite stark uh, division between that and, again, just over 20% of journalists who really thought there should be no uh, financial support at all. In other words, it should be a completely separate industry. This is my favorite one, um, which is, in general, do you think social media platforms have increased trust in journalism uh, or decreased trust in journalism? Now, I'm reasonably famous in my own small world at the Town Centre for not really believing in trust metrics. But we're constantly being told by the particularly sort of techno well-meaning technology industries, you have a problem, trust is declining in journalism. So we did think we'd ask newsrooms how they felt their trust had been affected by the relationship with social media and how social media was, infect was affecting their own field. 86% of respondents said that they felt platforms had decreased trust in journalism. Um, and only 3% uh, thought that it had um, increased. And a similar number said had no effect. Now, again, these are just impressions from newsrooms. These are how people feel. Uh, but I just thought it was very interesting that the temperature of the relationship is uh, tepid. Again, maybe no surprise to you. Do you think platform companies are doing more than enough, not enough, um, or enough to combat the problem of fake news and misinformation on their platforms? So in America, where obviously this has been huge, um, Facebook is the key villain, uh, if one can call it villain, in the eyes of, or rather it's not doing enough in the eyes of uh, newsrooms. Twitter uh, closed behind it. Interestingly enough, Google's cultivation of the um, journalism community seems to be paying off. So in terms of favorability ratings, they're doing better. Uh, there's lots of evidence to suggest that um, Google has a huge problem with misinformation, particularly on YouTube, yet they're not perceived by newsrooms as being um, more culpable than Facebook, which really got a pasting. Um, similarly, getting a pasting, <laughs> Um, if you flip the question, if you like, how sincere do you think Facebook, Twitter, and Google are in wanting to help journalism? Um, now, this was actually sort of quite interesting because the majority of respondents thought that Facebook were not at all sincere in, helping, in wanting to help journalism. Um, and only 43% of respondents thought that Google were 
not at all respond, or not, were, were not at all serious in wanting to help journalists. Again, we'll see a little bit later, Google has been cultivating that relationship much more actively. So uh, it's interesting to me that Facebook has a perception problem um, as well, if you like, as a practical problem. So we call this the platform press, if you like, which is that critical relationship between social platforms and what their responsibility is to journalism versus how what we used to think about as independent publishers are coping with more and more and more of their activities being subsumed. Um, we, what we've seen over the past two years is a real maturing of that relationship. So yes, there's a huge amount of skepticism and quite a bit of anger on behalf of publishers, but there's also an acceptance that the large technology company is now a part of the inevitable future of their businesses, and that, if you like, they're sort of growing up and learning how to work with it. So we have some quotes from publishers. Uh, here's one which is pretty typical, saying, yes, platform's important, but they're not the whole of our business. Um, Publishers also very clear-eyed saying, I don't think that they would ever do something to help us that would necessarily undermine their own business model. I'm not sure that's completely true from what we've seen in the last uh, few months, but it's certainly what they say. So we have a rhetoric, if you like, versus reality issue here, which is this standoff um, where journalism and newsrooms feel uh, distrustful to some extent of social media. They feel they should be doing a lot more to help journalism. They feel that they are responsible for a lot of the flaws in the information ecosystem. I'm not saying that's right, I'm just saying that's what they think. Um, but actually when you look at the data about how they're using the platforms, um, we see a slightly different picture. Sorry, this is the slide which Jess Lessin, who is the chief executive of the information, described as everything wrong with journalism in one slide. Um, and it's probably it's too small to read it, uh, but I can tell you that across the top, we have 23 publishers, 23 platforms, and by platforms, we take in everything from Apple News through to um, things like Line and Kick, um, and then right down this end, we have YouTube, um, and down the side, we've got uh, a sample of 14 different publishers that we tried to uh, keep a very varied, some are, some are regional, some are national, some are international, some are native, digitally native. So we have you know, a, a mix of you know, the LA Times, we have Vox, we have BuzzFeed, etc. Each green dot represents where publishers are actively pushing creating or designing content for, towards social platforms. The pink dots represent where publishers once had a presence, but at the moment it's dormant. And what we've seen in the past two years is a real shift from everybody trying everything to a sort of consolidation, if we like, of the really big platforms and the effective ones. So Facebook, Instagram, Instagram stories, um, YouTube, Twitter, etc. Everybody is on those platforms. They're maintaining their place on that pla those platforms. S poor old Snapchat Stories has had a very rough time. Publishers experimented with it and have abandoned it. That's not the same, incidentally, as Snapchat Discover, which is a slightly different product for publishers. Um, so we, we, we've also noted that there are one or two just grey spots on there, which is where... Um, publishers are not just dormant, but they've actually just abandoned the platform. And two of the grey lines are platforms, one is called List, L-I.S-T, and the other is Vine, and they've, t they've closed down in the period during which we were doing this research. So they've disappeared off the... Don't worry, if you can't, we will be posting the slides, so if you can't read them, unless you're like me, so when I actually I got them in reasonable format, my eyesight's now so bad I couldn't read them then either, but hopefully we'll make them um, viewable for everybody with uh, decent eyesight um, and share those. Uh, what's interesting though is that the total number of posts over two years, and this is sampling every quarter, hasn't really gone down. That big spike is the American election. So actually, sort of important point, how, how the way that publishers are posting to social is changing, but actually the amount they're posting is really not changing. It's very stable. Um, the big 
if you like blocks of color there. Twitter is purple. People tweet all the time. You'd expect that. It's no reflection of the business importance of it. Uh, the brown is Facebook, um, which is actually steady to slightly declining. Um, and then the red is Apple News. Now, what we don't have on here is Google AMP because it's very difficult to gather data for. Um, and we know that there is a whole other story about the rise of uh, search. Um, John Saroff, a chief executive of Chartbeat, did a really interesting presentation about that at lunchtime. But when we're talking about hosting platforms, if you like, those are the ones that we captured um, and measured. Uh, and then everything else in the middle are just much smaller platforms. Um, I won't sort of waste too much time on this. It's just showing you different types of publisher and really how dominant Apple News, Facebook, and Twitter are in that sort of hosted platform space. So the red are those big three. The green is everything else. And you can, again, see where the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the bigger news organizations just have much more resource to experiment with smaller platforms, uh, whereas other um, publishers have really sort of narrowed the number of things that they're, they're pub posting on. Um, have news organizations adapted? Uh, so first of all, they're adapting very well just by reorganizing themselves around being more like portfolio managers. I don't think this is news to anybody, hopefully, in this room. Um, again, two years ago, we saw people describing this situation as chaos or not really knowing what they should be doing. Now, we found that most of the publishers have organized themselves just to expect change all the time. Uh, and they're living with that in a pretty, um, in, in most cases, in a pretty sanguine way. Uh, again, maturity about what Facebook thinks. Um, I'm not going to make you read all these. This is another publisher saying, we're actually using our leverage on other platforms to balance our relationships with other types of social media. So maturity. So we see a maturing, and I, wasn't gonna, I was going to call it a conscious uncoupling from the Facebook uh, news feed. It's not quite conscious uncoupling, but it's certainly this idea that publishers have a little bit more control over their destiny in terms of what they post, when, and where. Um, and we've also seen this very strong pivot to audience. Again, I hope it's not news to anybody here, but the decline in advertising and the decline of social first um, has been uh, counterbalanced by people figuring out what they think about subscription or membership or other ways to connect with the audience um, in a more deep and, as one publisher said, meaningful manner. Um, what are the challenges? So I don't want you to go away with the impression, because I'm a pessimist, I don't want you to go away with the impression that this is all good news, hooray. Facebook has been banished, we're learning to live in this world, everything is rosy. Um, I think that if there was one thing which has really surprised us more than anything else, and which I think would be hugely surprising to people outside this room, but probably to not to people in it, is the extent to which platforms are now actively involved in the commissioning and shaping of news decisions made by publishers. Um, and this is a very representative quote, which is for one particular platform, um, you know, to know, for a third party to know, to be on, on Slack with them every day, pitching stories, telling people what's coming up, telling, telling a platform what's coming up, telling them what your budget decisions are. This now feels very like a publisher, uh, broadcaster type um, relationship. It doesn't any longer feel like a neutral um, we are, you know, we will just host what you give us. Uh, and from the platform point of view, we've also seen a big shift as well. So two years ago, we are absolutely not publishers. They're still saying we're not news organizations, but there's definitely a move towards saying some of what we do is editorial. And everything we understood from asking platforms what they would be uh, doing in the future and everything that we sensed from the publishers we talked about speaks to actually more of this. We think you'll see a lot more editorial activity coming up one way or another, coming up from platforms, whatever, however they call it. It might be called curation, might be called um, moderation, 
but effectively it will be a type of editorial uh, interference. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about local news. We call it local news exceptionalism because we have to understand that whatever is happening in one part of the news ecosystem, it's not happening everywhere. And in America, uh, we've seen through the period of our studies that even though local news is um, identified as a problem, it's really continued to struggle. This is a map of news deserts that, um, the, uh, that CJR, the Columbia Journalism Review, published a while ago. Again, it's in the slides, and you can read the articles online about it. Um, local publishers, this is the same problem. Uh, we simply don't have the resource to meet all of the changes and the requirements that are coming with new types of distribution. Um, Facebook, uh, back in January, I think this was, said, we, do, we want people to see high quality news resources and we really want them to see local news resources. Now, we do know that the um, algorithm for uh, the news feed, the changes were announced in January. Everybody who has dealt with the newsfeed algorithm thinks the changes probably happened in October. Uh, and again, uh, just referencing some chart beat data I saw earlier today saying people saw, you know, between 25, 40% drop-offs or almost nothing at all because they were, um, their, their businesses were optimized in a different way. So, and yet in the local market, and this is rather shocking, we, we looked at how um, interactions on Facebook were affecting local publishers and it's all negative and it's actually negative to quite a high degree so you have um, I, knew I, I knew I was not going to be able to see this properly um, so you have things even like the San Francisco Chronicle and the Denver Post and the Denver Post has um, notoriously been struggling under old and global capital its current um, owners you know d their interactions on Facebook are down over 60% now, Facebook has said, they, they saw this data and they challenged it, and they said, well, you know, that's just interactions. And our point was, just interactions are, first of all, the metrics that they often use. Secondly, they're the only things available to us to measure. And thirdly, Facebook have been express, ex expressly saying that news which encourages meaningful interactions will be raised above those that don't. Um, so, you know, Yes, there's dispute about whether or not this data is correct, but I don't think there's any dispute that this is what local publishers have um, experienced in the market. Um, if you're wondering why philly.com is doing so well down the bottom, so that actually saw um, a huge spike, 40%. Well, the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl. Um, and I can tell you now, with a rudimentary knowledge of uh, American football, that's not going to happen every year. So it will probably look quite different for them next year. Um, we know that local publishers just have structural disadvantages. Again, on the left, New York Times. I know it has a different demographic, but it's also local newspaper based in New York has just made itself international. It's internationalized. New York Daily News is still pretty much focused on the New York market. You, we just see over and over again far more diversity um, in publishers who have larger resources. It's not rocket science, as they say. So what about financial stability and uh, reclaiming the reader? Again, I think, I hope you'll be expecting this because it's been experienced just about everywhere. So we're seeing a really sharp decline in the use of ad-sponsored native publishing products. So what that means is um, the products that the platform companies were coming to market with to help create more advertising revenue for publishers have by and large failed. Here is uh, Facebook Live. Now Facebook Live may not be a failed product per se, but the first red line um, uh, is the introduction of payments for publishers to create Facebook Live feeds. Uh, the blue line is the number of Facebook Live posts that publishers put up. The second red line is when the payment stopped, uh, and you can see exactly what happens after that. So in other words, unless you're directly incentivized, there is nothing really for the publishers who've been trying it to suggest that these are actually going to be financially helpful products. Same is true, sorry, this is the world's least comprehensible slide, but I'll hopefully tell you what's going on in it, which is in January um, 2018, we looked at the percentage of 
publishers, 78 publishers who had signed up for Facebook uh, instant articles. In that month, in January 2018, about half of them, 38 of them, posted zero posts. So that's all you really need to look at is that far left column that says half of the initial publishers on the Facebook instant articles test ju have just abandoned it or they're not posting anything on it. And then we see a sort of a variation for how many people were posting sort of slightly more posts. There are still one or two publishers who are very committed to it, but in general, um, people have abandoned it. Um, how are they changing their posting behavior? It's all about driving traffic back to your site. And we know that people talk about this, but they're actually doing it. Um, the green is where uh, people are using things like Facebook instant articles, which we know is on the decline, Instagram stories, which is actually on the rise. So where you're creating something specifically for a platform, Snapchat stories, that's the green. We see actually quite a sharp decline in that. Uh, we see um, this red block is actually what we call native paywalls. So in other words, these are treatments where people are posting paywalled or subscription links to social, which was not happening before and is now happening in an increasing amount. And at the bottom, the blue is a resurgence of that posting of links to get people back to sites. So all of this behavior adds up to exactly the same thing, which is a diminution of the importance of social, potentially in terms of uh, posting and being read, a rise in the importance of search, which is something which is not in this presentation, but which we have heard people say, um, and a very sort of aggressive, if you like, pivot towards getting subscription links out to, um, out to social platforms as well. Uh, and, and this is just how those incentives change according to the business model. So again, the ones with the most paywall posts, like the Los Angeles Times, generally speaking, have the most pressure on their business models, um, and they've had to sort of be much more aggressive about making sure that they're making money or they're getting people back to the site, posting also almost nothing um, natively to social platforms. Um, so yes, we're moving to a place basically where platforms are lead generators. So if you can't read all that. Um, pivot to paid uh, is obvious, it's everywhere, um, and it is showing up in all the social signals as well. Um, there's still some questions among pub publishers about how they best do that over social. Uh, now, more interesting, well, not more interesting, but very interesting in a way is how the platforms themselves respond to this, if you like, conscious uncoupling. Not conscious uncoupling, that's a bit too Gwyneth Paltrow, but certainly to this um, understanding from news publishers that they won't be building their houses on other people's land in quite the same way that they were two or three years ago. Um, platforms are moving from indirect support to direct support. So, one of the things I think that all of these points underline is that it is possible to imagine a world in which social platforms say we don't want anything to do with news, we are mo moving further away from it. Um, I actually think what's happening is that they are moving much more aggressively into the center of news. So they've gone from indirect support to direct support. Um, this is a very wordy slide, but actually this is very important. So 2015, all we saw were launches of advertising supported products. AMP, Twitter Moments, uh, Facebook Live, uh, sorry, Facebook Instant Articles. And it was kind of a, a, a sort of a, a, a Apple News. It was a sort of an idea that these tools and outlets for publishers would generate enough advertising actually to be sort of to capture um, a, a robust publishing relationship. When that started to fail, 2016, 2017, and after the election, when you suddenly had a new set of external pressures on platforms, you saw much more triage of what I would call failing products um, and changes. So for instance, Apple News went from zero to hero, largely by staffing up its um, 
largely by staffing up its newsroom, uh, promising to do much, much more about uh, subscription, etc. But then when you get to 2018, almost everything that we've seen this year from platforms has been about moving more money into directly into the journalistic market or declaring themselves in some way or another to be helping journalism. So in other words, we've gone from, hey, if you use our products, you'll make more money, to, oh, this isn't quite working, to how do we become more involved um, in publishing one way or another? How can we actually make this work? Um, so Google has put $300 million into the US market to mirror the DNI initiative here. Um, Apple uh, is launching subscription. Um, Snap, Snapchat, also holding media accelerators, etc. Um, they've gone from being not the arbiters of truth to becoming editorial. So this was sort of protected under CDA 230 in the States. It's a good legal reason to say we have no responsibility for content, and yet they are assuming much more responsibility. This is Apple News in the States last month, who uh, bought or hosted a, an extract of John McCain's book. As far as I know, it's the first time um, a platform of this type has said this is our exclusive story. Uh, business imperatives are changing to civic imperatives. Uh, Jack Dorsey here from Twitter saying he wants to improve the health of the national conversation or the inter international, in your case, discourse. And uh, how can we do that? Facebook, under intense pressure, are committing to something called a civil rights audit, never before seen. Google have said that they will hire tens of thousands of more moderators. Again, remember, this is basically an editorial function um, to police their material. So this competitive pressure, this is, a, if you like, an outgrowth of competitive pressure being less important than uh, regulatory pressure. So if you're Mark Zuckerberg, you are no longer so worried about Snapchat but you're uh, very worried about the European uh, Competition Commissioner. Um, and uh, Margaret uh, Vestager has been doing an amazing job of changing their priorities. Um, I think that leads us to a point where we've been worried about how are the new gatekeepers being controlled. Um, GDPR, uh, an enormous subject for most people in this room and around the world in publishing, is of enormous concern to the central platforms. It's probably going to result in more of a consolidation of power rather than shifting to more competition. Um, in terms of the crystal ball, and where does this leave us? So, so I have just about done 60 slides in 30 minutes or 25 minutes. Um, so these are kind of, there are a lot of open questions, but it seems to me that where we're pointed in the future is, is pretty clear from, on, on some basis. So for news organizations, the next two years are all about owned and operated rather than social first. Uh, you know, one of the, there is a fascinating study to be done, and maybe we will do it, on what happens to social first organizations like BuzzFeed, like Mike, like lots of very energetic and innovative um, organizations that really thought by abandoning all of the kind of paraphernalia of uh, owned and operated publishing, you would move faster, earn more, grow quicker. Um, the second thing is um, an outgrowth of the first thing, which is audience-driven strategies uh, over advertising-driven. I think everyone knows that now. Uh, this one's very important and interesting, particularly in the American market, which is lots of opportunities for civic and um, citizens, what we're calling citizen-supported media. So if you were going to ask me to make a prediction for the next year, I would say, I think we're going to see platforms putting much more money into this area, particularly aimed at local news, which is the non-profit civic media area. Um, it's always been the poor relation of funding journalism, um, but with the decline of advertising, it looks as though it's going to be much, much more significant. And in America, where concepts of quality are irrevocably tied to the free market. This is particularly important. Um, there will continue to be pressure to change on news organizations from technology companies. A couple of people have said during this um, 
survey and also I heard a couple of people saying exactly the same thing today saying I'm worried we're not going to be innovative enough that we're outsourcing innovation to third party platforms I don't think you need to worry about that um, artificial intelligence is really going to push the news industry the big concern is how niche and smaller publishers deal with these big steps in functionality and uh, big changes in business models um, the, the increasing value of mission is showing up in everything. It's showing up in how algorithms rank news. It's showing up in how well, uh, how effective news organizations are at raising subscriptions. It's showing up in how um, large technology platforms are thinking about giving away money. So, you know, if you don't have a mission, if you're a very aggressively commercial news outlet, this too is probably going to play to your disadvantage. So platforms, who knows? But we would certainly expect much more explicit role in news and news, news, news curation, news moderation, and I think probably news creation as well. Um, we think that support for journalism, uh, we always talked in our previous research about picking winners. Everything we've heard in the past six months makes us think that it will be much more direct rather than indirect, and it will be selective. So we now have uh, platform organizations, Campbell Brown, head of news at Twitter, news partnerships at, um, sorry, at Facebook. Campbell Brown the other day said um, on a platform in New York, you know, you shouldn't just organize your business around our news feed. And one of the things, you know, we can tell you now is that not everyone is going to benefit in the same way. Um, so that's a very big shift. It's obviously driven by misinformation, fake news, the idea that anyone can be a publisher but isn't. Um, newsroom capabilities, so in other words, skills that are practiced will grow whether they are human or automated. There's a big um, ideological battle, particularly in the middle of Facebook, about is this just about refining AI or is it actually about changing the nature of what we are? Um, that's a moot point and it'll be very interesting to see how it develops. Uh, and then the last and very obvious one, which is the focus for now is entirely on regulatory challenge rather than competitive challenge. And I think there's an interesting reason behind that, one of which is thanks to journalists who have pushed the agenda on this one. Actually, to be able to cope with some of the proposed legislation, you have to be an entrenched incumbent. There's nothing to say that regulatory pressure is going to make the market more fragmented or innovative unless there's a wholesale breakup of these companies. And we honestly don't see that happening in America. It might happen in a balkanized way elsewhere, but in America, we see this as being more of a um, finding different ways to um, apply pressure, particularly to data ownership and control, um, and particularly to sort of role and scope. Open questions. I'll leave you with these so you can go and enjoy a free drink. Um, oversight. We still don't really know how any of these companies, which are increasingly the heart of what we do, are actually going to be governed. That's a huge open question. Um, effect on journalistic independence. This is not often addressed because most people uh, have some money these days from a large technology company. Um, I'm, you know, Google, Matt Aff, I know is here, Google underwrites such a huge number of journalistic gatherings, one hardly dare say it, um, but as money moves into uh, not just supporting conferences, but also hiring journalists in something like Report for America, where Google is providing 30% of the funding, uh, we have to keep reminding ourselves, however often we're on Slack with them, these companies are much bigger than news and they are involved in every aspect of civic life. So if you're a local newsroom and you're propped up by Google money, how do you feel about investigating the contracts that Google is signing with your local schools or your local city hall or your local hospital or wherever they're proliferating software? Um, it's not often talked about but it ought to be talked about a lot more, which is what do we do about that balance of independence versus, um, versus support. Um, and then I think that this is a key one, and it's why I'm pleased to be able to show you some very parochial slides from America to a very cosmopolitan audience. 
which is if you see a coming storm anywhere, I think it's in markets outside Europe and outside um, America, where all of these platforms also operate and where the news environments have a really significant impact on democracy and on civic discourse and where there's been almost no development by social platforms of an understanding of what to do with it. I now have to stop, but that's all right because it's the final slide. And th thank you very much, Bertrand. Emily, thank you so much. It's a testament to the intelligence of, uh, and, and the, the substance of your, your, your talk that so many people uh, have hung in uh, on this gorgeous uh, late Thursday afternoon. That concludes uh, the programming for today, and now you have to make a decision. Um, and there are two very enticing options. There are the Digital Journalism Awards are at the 